the World Free Zones Organization presents New World Model, the Future of Industry. Featuring Thomas Cooney from the IFPMA, Majid Kadumi from Medtronic, Carlos Nueno from Teladoc Health International, Welcome to our virtual discussion on the healthcare sector. The speakers we have interviewed for you have explored the challenges and opportunities facing healthcare providers, pharmaceutical manufacturers, as well as medical technology companies as they explore ways to collaborate and provide solutions to this pandemic threat. The questions cover the evolution of the crisis, the vectors of change observed in the industry, the way in which business models would evolve and the impact on the global supply chain. Each speaker's full interview is also available on the event site for your viewing pleasure. Be sure to look out for our industrial report on the sector, which we will publish shortly after this event. I hope you will obtain valuable intelligence from this panel, along with the other online discussions, interview, and live webinars that this event has to offer. What has changed most radically in the industry during this crisis? I think speed of decision making is really what's uh, shaping industry today. And so adapting to a very unstable environment and being very nimble and very fast. One of the things that will stay with us going forward is the actual design of the patient pathways. This has been interrupted and will stay with us for a very long time. How we design hospitals, how hospitals interact with patients, how technology companies interact with hospitals has to be designed in a way that enables minimal interaction, even post the call, uh, and provides for the ability to support remotely uh, most of the activities, uh, as much as possible out of the activities. I dare to say we started from a strong position because because of the success of our industry based on a strong innovation ecosystem with strong protection of intellectual property, we didn't start from square one from scratch, for example, to develop treatments for COVID-19, although it's something new. We already had a lot of experience in vaccines development. Normally it takes 10 to 15 years to develop a new vaccine. And here we are talking about maybe first COVID-19 vaccines coming up for approval end of this year, maybe available at large scale spring, summer next year. This is so uh, fast. Which types of companies have been the most affected? When I compare the supply chains of the pharma industry, innovative pharma industry, for example, with the challenges governments had to provide uh, protective care, uh, PPEs or masks or respiratory, I must say the pharma industry was probably much better prepared than many governments were for a pandemic. One of the reasons was a contingency planning that uh, big pharma companies always think about what if, and we do need to have more than one uh, factory manufacturing so that we are also not too much dependent on, for example, uh, borders closed, export restrictions, whatever. And by and large, the pharma industry has done rather well. Second, um, there are uh, businesses that are relying more on face-to-face. -face. And here you see the brick and mortar versus the online. And clearly those that are more relying on face-to-face -face has suffered. I come from healthcare, even hospitals have suffered through this COVID-19 as they couldn't do the normal activity. So yes, any company that does business within the hospital setting is impacted and this is where I think uh, an opportunity arises is how do you actually expand and continue to keep access uh, with the patient staying outside of the hospital as much as possible, connecting with their stakeholders and healthcare practitioners. 
uh, uh, without the need to come to the hospital. And I, I guess that's where most biotech companies are thinking of. In what region will the impact be most severe in the short term? Uh, regions that have actually put laws and strictly monitored it around uh, social distancing and other recommended behaviors socially uh, are the regions that will have the least impact out of a, a potential second wave or a prolonged activity of the virus in their regions. And that's across uh, all the different regions around the world. So you see healthcare becoming more relevant in the US, in Europe, in Asia and in Latin America. So that, I think this is one of the sectors that you'll see that uh, has uh, more uh, to win out of this situation. When I think about the next few months or so, my biggest concern is countries where in low and middle income countries where you have health systems which are inherently weak, where you do not have a strong infrastructure. Weak health systems are challenged tremendously, and we need to show solidarity with them. What is the greatest challenge to overcome in the short term? When you think about vaccine, the biggest volume vaccine ever manufactured is against polio, 450 million doses apart from seasonal flu vaccination. Here we talk about potential need of 12 to 15 billion doses you need to immunize to get herd immunity against SARS-CoV-2, against COVID-19, because the expectation is that you will need two doses per person. This logistical challenge in terms of scaling up manufacturing for vaccines where you don't know once you take the investment decision whether your vaccine will be effective, that is a daunting challenge. But at the same time, and that's the second one, I think we also need to really be serious about expectation management. One single uh, challenge, it will be again uh, accessibility. It will be again protecting the healthcare delivery system from the verge of collapsing. You know, the, there is a huge amount of pressure that is taking place at most of uh, healthcare practitioners around the world, trying to deal with the utmost urgency, trying to firefight in many ways. Um, and this system depends on these healthcare practitioners. In order to achieve that, we need a solid action plan. And a solid action plan basically in two fronts. I think safety, so we need to feel safe, all of us. And second, economically. So we need strong economical measures. How should companies adapt to face this challenge? There's a lot of people saying that uh, this crisis um, is the end of globalization. I think it's the opposite. I think that shows that we need to scale we need to be uh, more global uh, using technology and transforming all of our uh, businesses. Trust within the organization, um, dropping down the walls, making sure that collaboration truly is, is something that is promoted but also made easy uh, so that people can, uh, can uh, share best practices, but also take away from each other a lot of the pressures they see. In addition, what we have also seen in this COVID-19 situation is a need. We need to reach out. We need to develop partnerships and we need to develop public-private partnerships. And we need to think about the normal business model will, you know, continue to be the mainstream. As any other crisis, uh, we need to take advantage of this situation to accelerate transformation of our businesses. And uh, whether it is to use more online channels, to use digitali digitalization, automation, uh, to become more environmentally friendly, to use data, um, all this is uh, now an opportunity to transform our businesses. What new business models are likely to emerge in the medium to long term? Virtual care is a perfect example or telemedicine of how uh, you know, patients and uh, healthcare professionals are using technology to communicate. But more than that, 
I think what's really going to transform healthcare and it's transforming healthcare is the uh, integration of technology within the healthcare ecosystem. Uh, I think the first one, accessibility, collaborating, bringing together companies that work in the same field is actually very beneficial. It, it provides a much stronger platform for accessibility. And then the differentiator between one company and, the, and another could be how the technology is built, uh, how the quality has been proven through clinical studies and clinical systems. And that's where probably the competition could, could start behaving in more silos. What we see now in pandemic preparedness is really an open collaborative effort, fully respecting that at the end of the day, when it comes to a product, you still have uh, IP rights because you do want people to have an incentive to invest. But I would expect different sorts and new sorts of collaboration. What new opportunities will this create? I think one of the shortcomings of pre-COVID-19 was the private sector was normally not allowed in. It was, you know, told that if we allow you in, you have a conflict of interest that doesn't work. But then you miss out a lot of expertise. And I think now we see that the private sector has responded to the crisis in a way I think everybody would hope it responds. I think we do get credit for doing the right thing. Um, so the more companies evolve and bring in technologies that will make it easier to connect remotely, I think that that would big, bring a big impact, which is basically changing and redesigning the patient pathways to include a lot of these virtual technologies in it and embedded so that the hospital is only needed to really treat the episode as much as possible. Specifically in health, of course, we are seeing, you know, from uh, primary, virtual primary care to teledermatology, to telestroke, um, robotic surgery, medical devices that are connected, the use of data from medical devices to be able to uh, prevent healthcare. So what we call connected health. How will these changes transform the industry value chain? I would expect that there will be more geographic diversification than we had in the past, because if you can't supply an innovative drug, the cost of you know losing out on opportunities is much bigger than, let's say, the cost of diversification. Uh, and uh, this is this is. Uh... Uh, I think the main goal now for, for every healthcare system is to actually uh, be able to connect uh, value or payment to the outcomes of the patient and move away from the patient having to pay for the actual activity regardless of the outcome. That, I think, in the near future is going to have to disappear or be reduced. We are helping patients avoiding a lot of an inefficient processes, avoiding a lot of uh, unnecessary uh, movements and delays, and improving healthcare outcomes. So I think um, this is a perfect example of how a value chain, in this case a global value chain, uh, is transformed by the use of uh, technology, providing a better service to the end customer. For more insights from each of our speakers, please take a look at our exclusive individual in-depth interviews available on our website.